Good morning all. Is my mic on? It is, yes. Thank you, Michael, for playing the prelude. Your music always helps to set the ambiance conducive for worship, and your voice and choice of music is absolutely superb. Before we start uh, the worship service, I have an announcement to make about the annual general meeting for St. Andrew's United Church. Because it will be virtual over Zoom, the board has decided that it should be broken into two sessions. The full report will be sent by email as a PDF to all members and adherents of the church before the meeting. For those without email capabilities, a paper copy will be delivered to your home. The first Zoom meeting will be held before the regular service on February the 28th, starting at 9.15. At this time, each of the items will be presented and there will be time for questions. The next Sunday, March 7th, will be the formal AGM where the vote will take place. Details on the voting procedures based on the fact that it's held by Zoom are being finalized and will be provided to you well in advance of the meeting. It will also be before the worship service starting on Zoom at 9.15. Be it known that we are grateful to be on the traditional territories of the Iroquois and the Mississauga nations. And we are grateful, as I mentioned before, to have Michael to lead us in the hymns and on the uh, organ. And for Declan Scott, for the Ministry of Music, for Maria Bercy, who will lead the worship for children of all ages, for Gwyneth Mast, who will read this, uh, today's scripture, for Louise Marshall, who is our speaker for today, and of course, the liturgy is created by Michelle Irwin. Whoever you are, Wherever you are from and however many times you have been to prison, whatever you doubt or believe, however many real or virtual tattoos you do or do not have, you are welcome here. In these times of isolation and social distancing, where we can be lonely even though we may not be alone, we know that we each can pass the peace of Christ among us either in person or virtually. Faith, board of God, O oh, call us yet, bind us to all who will follow you. Please join Michael in singing hymn 580, Faith of Our Fathers, verses 1 and 4.
Let us worship. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes, into your brother's face, and to say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. Please pray with me. God of love, peace, and unity, we thank you for welcoming us all just as we are, for making us equal as your children from all corners of the earth, for giving us your blessings as your children, and for making us belong. We pray that you help us to realize that we are all made in your image, and we need to bring peace to all your creation as one people who belong to you. We ask this through Christ our brother. Amen. Shall we gather at the river where the bright angels' feet have trod? Please join Michael in singing hymn 710, Shall We Gather at the River, verses 1 and 3. Jesus said, suffer the little children, for they come unto me. But it's not just the little children, it's children of all ages. Please welcome Maria Bercy as she leads the children's worship. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys? I want to say good morning and happy uh, Black History Month to you. I do not have my apologies, a story about Black history. And I want to say I'm sorry about that, but we are going to rectify that later in the month. Do not worry. But this morning's story it is a long one, but it's a good one. It's Faja Singh Keeps Going, and it has some interesting themes in here. And the most, one of the one I think you guys will like a lot is about age and how you're never too young or too old to do the things you love. And our beloved city of Toronto makes a guest appearance towards the end. So settle in and we'll read this one together. We won't have much time to chat at the end. So just know, that regardless how old you are, Faja and I believe you can do whatever is in your heart, okay? And Faja's foreword says, all my life, people set limitations on me. They said I would never walk. They said, when they said I would never farm, they certainly thought I would never set records about my running. No matter what people said, I always believed in myself. I knew my body better than anyone else. I knew what I was capable of. I kept trying. I never gave up. I always held on to hope. I wish the people from my birthplace of Punjab could see me now. The boy they teased for not being able to walk became the oldest person to ever run a marathon. I was the first 100-year-old to ever run 26.2 miles. Doctors couldn't figure out why I had trouble walking as a child, nor could they figure out why I was able to begin walking and eventually running. 
I think of it as a reminder that all our bodies are different and so are our experience with disabilities. I'm now 108 years old, which means I'm probably more than 100 years older than you. Can you believe that? My secret to a long and healthy life has been taking care of my mind, my body, and soul. Every day I challenge myself to think, exercise, eat healthy, and pray. I really have enjoyed my long life, and I hope you have a long and healthy life too. I'd love for you to take care of yourself, try your hardest, and always choose yes when you meet a challenge. And who knows, maybe one day you can break my record for the oldest person to ever run a marathon. Nothing would make me happier. Find Faja Singh. Okay. Well, here's our story. It was a sweltering summer. Little Faja Singh sat under the shade of a banyan tree in his village in Punjab, eating mangoes and watching the other children play. Faja was smart and funny. He and his friends liked to play cards and marbles while sitting in a circle and telling jokes. But Faja longed to join them when they ran and jumped. He longed to play hop hopscotch to rescue a runaway cricket ball or to run with a kite flying high across the sky. He wished he felt as strong as his name, which meant warrior lion. When he was very little, his parents thought he might never walk. Month after month and year after year went by, but Faja did not take a single step. Aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas shook their heads gravely and said, it's too hard, he's too weak. But Faja did not listen and Faja did not stop. Instead, every morning he would listen to his mother who said, you know yourself Faja and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. Faja practiced walking outside his family's hut each day, staying in the mud to soften every fall. He practiced and prayed for months. He could feel himself getting stronger inside and out. Then a few days after Faja's fifth birthday, a wonderful thing happened. He took one step and another, and then another, and another, and another. Faja Singh was finally walking. Faja's parents were proud that their son understood what he was capable of and that he worked hard to achieve his goals. They were thrilled Faja could walk because he knew it, because they knew it would make his life easier. His parents were so happy. They shared prayers of thanks and distributed Parshad to the entire village. Once Faja began to walk, his legs needed strengthening. He practiced walking around the banyan tree every day. Some bullies thought his leg looked like sticks. And they teased Faja by calling him Danda. But Faja did not listen and Faja did not stop. Though his legs were weak, Faja's spirit was strong. But Faja, as Faja got bigger, it was time to go to school. But the school was miles away from his small village. There were no buses. Faja's legs could not carry him all that distance and they couldn't bring the school to him. So while Faja's friends went to school, he got his education on the farm, learning to plant, plow, and pick all kinds of crops. It's too hard. He's too weak, said the neighbors. Faja did not listen and Faja did not stop. He'd walk behind the buffaloes, planting seeds and getting stronger with each step. Faja worked and worked. He walked and walked. He farmed and farmed and farmed. And when Faja turned 15, the whole village witnessed a new wonder. Faja could walk an entire mile. Faja progressed by leaps and bounds and took many big steps over the next few years. He got married, he had children, and he even got his own farm. Faja loved life in Punjab. He loved flying kites in the open fields with his children. He loved the excitement of a close cricket match played with friends. And he loved the joy that filled the village during the harvest festival of Vaikashi. Faja's children had a farm just like his father had taught him. Every morning he would tell his children, you know yourselves and what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. He cherished every step in his life's journey. As time passed, Faja's children grew up and moved to places far away. Faja, who was usually lively and energetic, grew sad and lonely, especially after his wife died. He missed his family and wanted to be with them. But to leave his village at the age of 81 to live on the other side of the world? Could Faja do it? His friends were worried. You're too old, Faja, they said. It's too hard for you to move away. Faja didn't listen and Faja didn't stop. He knew it was time for him to take a step in a new direction. One day, Faja got on an airplane for the first time and went to live with his family in England. It was cold in England and almost everyone only spoke English. Faja was used to having many friends, but here he felt like a stranger. His family was busy with school and work. Faja found himself with nowhere to go and nothing to do. Faja passed his days in the living room, staring at the television. He had never been so miserable. As he was flipping channels one day, he saw something new. 
a whole lot of people were running around town. Was it a fire, an accident? No, Fajr realized they were just running to run and they all had big smiles on their faces. Fajr knew at once he had to try this. He put on his shoes and walked out the door. He took one step and another and another and another and another. Fajr Singh was running. The wind flowed through his beard and for the first time in a long time, a smile appeared on his face. After that day, there was no stopping Fajr. He began by running a little bit every morning. As he got stronger, he ran faster and longer. And when he felt especially strong, he could even run in again in the evenings before eating dal and roti with his family. In England, it was common to see people running for fun, but not many of them looked like Faja Singh. Some people would stare and some would laugh, but Faja did not let that bother him. He ran and ran through the streets and parks of England, getting better and better each day. He ran races and he ran for fun. He ran with his friends and he ran alone, always with a smile on his face. He loved running. He liked the new friends he made. He enjoyed exploring the new country he now called home. And he loved how being outdoors reminded him of his childhood, of playing hopscotch and flying kites in the fields. It had been a long time since he felt this happy. More than anything, Faja loved the challenge. He'd always enjoyed pushing his limits, whether it was learning to walk, doing farm work, or moving to a new country. Now he was ready for his next challenge. He started training with a coach, Harmander Singh, who had run many marathons and had trained others to run marathons too. There was no looking back after that. Harmander and Faja ran together many times a week. After months of hard work, 89-year-old Faja Singh became the oldest person to ever complete the 26.2-mile London Marathon. Faja ran the London Marathon five more times after that, each faster and faster, getting faster each year and setting new records each time. By this point, Faja was famous as people in England followed this man with a beard, turban, and disarming smile running great distances, began to learn more about his Sikh background. Around this time, Faja learned that some people in the United States were attacking Sikhs for how they looked. Faja knew this was wrong and he wanted to help, but he wasn't sh sure how to share his message. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he couldn't speak English, but he could run. And at once, Faja knew what he had to do. He decided to run the world's biggest marathon in New York City. By now, Faja was 93 years old. Could he still run 26.2 miles? Many newspaper reporters didn't think so. But Faja did not listen and Faja did not stop. Every day he practiced with his coach. Every night he dreamed about running. And every morning he reminded himself of his mother's words. You know yourself, Faja, and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. The big race finally came on a chilly November day in 2003. Faja Singh stood at the start line. He felt ready, knowing he had prepared as well as he could. He stretched in anticipation and recited a prayer, envisioning what it would feel like to cross the finish line. Just then, someone shouted racist and hateful words at him. Other people joined in. Faja brushed it off. He knew he had a strong spirit, ran one foot in front of the other, and then disaster. The tender blisters on the soles of his feet had burst and he was in a world of pain. He kept going, limping to the finish line. He made it, but it was his slowest time ever. Faja was so exhausted that he collapsed right after the race. Medics wanted to rush into an ambulance and take him away to recover. Faja preferred to stay and recover in the company of his trainer and fellow runners. Faja made it back to England and for the first time in a long while, he was sad. Faja had wanted to run fast and show the world what Sikhs could achieve, but he felt like his poor performance at the world's biggest marathon made him look weak and that he had failed his Sikh brothers and sisters all over the world. Maybe they were right, said a voice in his mind. Maybe it is too hard. Maybe you are too weak. The voice made Faja doubt himself for the first time in years, and it tried to convince him to quit running altogether. But Faja did not listen. Inspired by his coach, he set a new goal for himself. He was going to be the first 100-year-old person to ever run a full marathon. Faja ran every single day for years. He ran and ran. He practiced and practiced. He trained and trained. And when the day came, he knew he was ready. On October 16, 2011, Faja Singh lined up at the start of the Toronto Waterfront Marathon. He was so excited that it felt like an electric current was flowing through his body. He ran along the course and people joined him for a few miles at a time to show their support. He welcomed them with a smile, offering jokes to adults and high fives to children. 
As he ran, Faja thought about all the things people had said he would never do. They said he couldn't walk, but he did. They said he couldn't farm, but he did. They thought he was too old to run, and yet here he was, running 26.2 miles at the age of 100. Faja had never been more sure of himself. He hoped that children and adults everywhere would see him take on this difficult challenge and persevere with grace, something he'd learned through his faith. It took him just over eight hours, but he finally did it. Faja Singh finished the Toronto Marathon and set a new world record as the oldest person to ever run a marathon. He stood tall and smiled proudly, holding tightly to his medal. He had faced many challenges in, one, in his 100 years, but Faja Singh always kept going. Uh, and it says here on the bottom, his final time was eight hours, 11 minutes, and 5.9 seconds. The end. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this book by Simran Jeet Singh, illustrated by Baljinder Kar. And I think we should just say a short prayer to end for today. Okay, you put your hand on your heart. Dear God, help us to remember the words of Faja's mother, we know who we are and we know what we're capable of. Today is a day to do our best. Amen. Thank you, Maria. Please pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let us listen to the sacred words of God with Gwyneth Mast. Good morning. The scripture this morning is from the message. The first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. We don't want you in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad we didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we'd been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. Not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. And he did, rescued us from certain doom. And he'll do it again, rescuing us as many times as we need rescuing. You and your prayers are part of the rescue operation. I don't want you in the dark about that either. I can see your faces even now, lifted in praise for God's deliverance of us a rescue in which your prayers played such a crucial part. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. My response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take it in with all followers of Jesus, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Gwyneth. Our songs in the Ministry of Music are Abelassen Fanfare, composed by Gottlieb Riesch and Ash Ash Ashokan, I may not be pronouncing that right, Ashokan Farewell, composed by Jay Unger. And both of these are performed by Declan Scott. Welcome, Declan. Hello. Good morning. Um, so I actually have three pieces today. One of them didn't make it into the, to the script. Um, so the first one is uh, the Ableton Fanfare. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the instrument I'm playing and a little bit about the song. Um, so this is an E flat trumpet. 
a regular. I'm going to be playing three trumpets for you today. Um, the regular trumpet, you probably know, is the B flat trumpet. And as you can probably see, the E flat trumpet is a little bit smaller, so it plays a little bit higher. And so the piece is by Fried Gottfried Reich. And if you want, you can look up a picture of him. The most common picture, he's holding a little wound up horn, and he has a little piece of music. And on that piece, of, in that painting of him, is the piece I'm playing today. I think they transcribed it from there. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not a historian. But here's the piece. On the theme of hope, as I was told today's service is about, I wanted to pick hopeful music. So this next piece that I'm going to be playing is um, Summon the Heroes by John Williams. Uh, it was written for the 1996 Olympics and is probably one of the most hopeful pieces I know. Um, yeah, here we go. And by the way, yeah, this is on the B-flat trumpet, I think. So our third and final piece and our third and final trumpet is, is the Ashokan Farewell on the C trumpet. So as you can see, it's a little bit smaller than the B-flat trumpet even. Can you see? A little bit. And so it plays a little bit higher. So I'll play the same note on both trumpets, and it'll sound a little bit different. So here's a C on a C trumpet. And here's a C on a B-flat trumpet. So they're used for different kinds of things. Um, the B-flat trumpet, I don't know how many of you guys played in band as kids, but those are the trumpets that you play in band, and you see in jazz band, and you see in, like, Miles Davis always would be playing a, a B-flat trumpet. And the C trumpet you see more commonly in the orchestra. So if you ever see the Toronto Symphony, they'll be playing these kinds of trumpets. Um, so this last piece I'm playing is the Ashkin Farewell. It's a... Uh, it's a Celtic waltz of sorts, although very slow. It's more of a hymn than anything. Um, it's very beautiful, I hope, and uh, I hope you enjoy.
Thank you. We are truly blessed here at St. Andrews United Church to have the volunteers to step forward and help with our worship service. Thank you, Declan. We really appreciate that. And now please welcome Louise Marshall as our speaker for this morning. Welcome, Louise. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope you feel better. I hope you have a healthy baby. I hope you get an A in that class. I hope they like us. I hope we will make a difference in the world. I hope you get that raise. I hope we achieve world peace. I hope all nations resolve the climate crisis. Every day we use that small magical word, hope. It's tough to live or even make it through one day without hope. What is hope? Based on all the examples I just gave, I define hope like this. Hope is a vision for better days that changes us in the present. Hope is a vision for better days. There's something up ahead, around the corner, in sight, and it's good. But that good future isn't just abstract because it reaches in and transforms us in the present. So, for example, if you're hoping for an A in that class, that hope will, at least it should, motivate you to study right now. If you're hoping for a raise, you'll work harder. If you want to help resolve the climate issue, you may have to change your ways. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in the overflowing, bubbling over with hope. We will all battle hopelessness at some point in our lives. And no matter who we are or what our situation, hope is one thing we all desperately need. And the reason for this, Hope is powerful. Hope is more than a motivational thought or a fading daydream. Hope is a nothing is impossible with God firestorm, refusing to be quenched. It's an awareness that God is actually expecting, looking and longing to show you his goodness. Hope is what stabilizes your frantic thoughts and emotions. It's an awareness that there is no problem big enough to keep God from rescuing you. These days, it's easy to be worn down by hopelessness. People lose hope when they experience overwhelming loss, repeated failures, impossible situations, or when they're hurt by people they trust. Like most of you, I understand what it's like to feel hopeless. I have experienced my share of pain, disappointment, loss, and one bad thing after another. Because of this, I wouldn't get my hopes up. I used to say, if I don't expect anything good to happen, I won't be disappointed when it doesn't. But when I got serious about my relationship with God, I discovered real hope. I learned why hope is important and how powerful hope can be. Hope is a positive expectation that something good is going to happen to you because of God's great goodness. Hope is not a wishy-washy, vague, wait and see attitude, but an action we must choose to take on purpose each day. Hope and faith go hand in hand. Hope also enables us to endure hardships and long waiting periods. And God uses these times to develop character and endurance in us. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Be brave and of good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring. Yes, wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. Hope dares us to believe it. It thinks, you know what? Things might just work out after all. It's the sometimes unexplainable but always undeniable feeling that today would be a bad day to give up. Isaiah 40, 31 tells us, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Regardless of who you are or what condition your life is in, 
You can't function successfully without hope in God. If circumstances are bad, you surely need hope. And if they are good, you need hope that they will stay that way. Hope energizes and motivates us to take action by causing us to step out in faith and act in obedience with God's word. Hope believes boldly, decides daringly, speaks firmly, and perseveres passionately. When we embrace hope on purpose, it influences our thoughts, our attitudes, our outlook, and the way we speak. Hope builds us up as we wait on God. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, Hope releases joy, and the joy of the Lord becomes our source of strength. Do you think you're in an impossible situation? Don't stop believing. Never assume that where you've been or where you are is as good as it gets. And when your goal or your situation seems impossible, keep in mind that nothing is impossible for God. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like around you. God is greater than any obstacle you may be facing. Everything that has never been done is impossible until someone does it. So why can't it be you? Don't allow your mind to become a hindrance to the things you can accomplish in life. Think big the way God does. Choose to believe God is going to do something better in your life. Go ahead and get your hopes up. God is leading you to do something better than you can imagine. If you're hoping in God, you will not be ashamed at the outcome. People may say, you've lost your mind. That will never happen. It will happen if you'll put faith to it. Faith deferred makes the heart sick. But when it comes true, the Bible says it's a tree of life. Hope is the companion of power and the mother of success. Do you have hope for the future? Do you have hope for your children? Do you have hope for your marriage? Do you have hope for your health? Do you have hope for the business problem that you're going through? Do you have hope for the future of our country and the future of planet Earth? People are sometimes limited by the place of their birth. People are sometimes limited by the color of their skin. But people are definitely limited by the size of their hope. If you think you can't, you can't. And if you think you can with God's help, nothing is impossible. Not just a little bit of hope, but a big dose of hope. It splashes over on everyone you touch. Psalm 42.5 says, hope thou in God. And in Jeremiah 29.11, we find the words, for I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil plans for your future and a hope. God puts you on this earth with a specific assignment. You are here to do something that no one else can do. You have a divine destiny and you have an unlimited potential within you because of the hope that you have in God and in his word. The blessing that you cannot contain is possible when you think, when you begin to exercise hope. You have the favor of God in your future above your wildest dreams. If you will walk out in faith on the wings of hope, you can do what other people say is impossible for you to do. It can be done. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you take away hope, then life with all its fascinating opportunities is reduced to a treadmill of existence. Without hope, life becomes bleak, life becomes drab, life becomes a burden. Without hope, life is joyless. There's never ending pain. People without hope sink into depression. They have despair, life becomes meaningless. In the life of every believer, there is hope for tomorrow. There is hope for a breakthrough that you've been asking God for. There is hope for divine healing for your body or the body of someone in your family. There's hope for the prodigal child to come home. There is hope that God will send that special person into your life. 
God's word spoken in the mouth of a believer is not a wish. It's a divine command of spiritual authority. Hope is based on substance and evidence. St. Paul writes in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God says that when you look expectantly to him, he provides things that are invisible, unmovable, unfailing, and infinitely more valuable than the things of this world. He promises faith, healing, justice, and mercy. God offers joy, freedom, strength, and perseverance. Experience. He gives us security, peace, purpose, guidance, and salvation. God offers hope. I leave the short hope inspires, hope conquers, hope free. Thank you, Louise. Hope is a star that shines in the night, leading us on until the morning is bright. When God is a child, there's joy in our song. The last shall be first, the weak shall be strong, and none shall be afraid. Please join Michael in singing hymn number seven, Hope is a Star. confession. Our hearts are hard, O God, soften them with your love. Our minds are closed, O God, open them with your grace. Our feet are too firmly planted, O God, invite us to dance with you. Let us live and move and have our being in you, O God. We have the assurance of grace. God invites us to dance with him always, hand in hand, with all who grace our planet. This is the time in the service when we present our offerings. Whether we think of this as an obligation, a tradition, a tithe, a symbolic or real gift to God, it is a time to give thanks and to allow St. Andrew's United Church to do the work of the Lord. Thank you to those who offer their time and talents by communicating and sharing with others in the congregation and by sharing their resources through their offering. Let us celebrate by joining Michael in singing the hymn of dedication, hymn 540, Grant Us God, 
the grace of giving. Please pray with me the prayers of our people. I need you. I need your sense of time. Always I have an underlying anxiety about things. Sometimes I'm in a hurry to achieve my ends and I'm completely without presence. It's hard for me to realize that some growth is slow and not all possesses or processes are swift. I cannot discriminate between what takes time to develop and what can be rushed because my sense of time is dull. Oh, to understand the meaning of perspective that I may do all things with a profound sense of leisure time. I need your sense of order. The confusion of details of living is sometimes overwhelming. The little things keep getting in my way, providing ready-made excuses for failure to do and to be what I know I ought to do and ought to be. Much time is spent on things that are not very important, while significant things are put in an insignificant place in my scheme of order. I must unscramble my affairs so that my life will become order. Oh God, I need your sense of order. I need your sense of the future. Teach me to know that life is ever on the side of the future. Keep me alive in the future look and the high hope. Let me not be frozen either by the past or the present. Grant me, O oh patient one, your sense of the future without which all life would sicken and die. Amen. Will your anchor hold? It is fitting that the next hymn is, Will your anchor hold? We heard Louise speak about hope, the power within us. We just sang, hope is a star that shines in the night. And now it's up to us with all that's going on. Will our anchor hold in these storms of life? I'd like to go off script for a minute here, if I may. When I was an impressionable teenager, I went to Newton Brook United Church, and this hymn had a profound effect on myself and a number of my friends. The imagery in the verse painted vivid pictures in our head. Marlon Brando was starring in the motion picture Mutiny on the Bounty, and the images of the storms melted into the words of the hymn. We could see. We could feel the billows roll and the cables strain. We understood the choices of letting our anchor drift or remain firm. This was the 60s. This was a time of free love, drugs, and rock and roll. This was a time when we as youth had to choose the easy, fun way or keep founded deep, fastened to the rock of our religion or our faith. The church was built in 1960. And they managed to acquire an organ from the CBC Theater in Halifax. It was a theater organ. And so it had a few more stops than a church organ really required. It also had an echo organ, which was a set of pipes at the back of the sanctuary over top of the narthex. The organist was Robert Ho uh, Roger Hobbs. And he was a young organist and he was flamboyant, not as flamboyant as Virgil Fox, but he had a certain style. And whenever the hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold, was on the order of service, there was a twinkle in his eye and all the youth of the Tyros, the High Sea, and the Young People's Union were waiting with anticipation. Roger would pull out all the stops and a few extras that usually weren't heard in the church. The hymn would start in the usual way, but as Roger pulled the stops and pressed on the pedal, the clouds unfolded, <laughs> the strong tides rose and the cables strained. And by the time we got to the chorus, Roger would hit one of the pistons with his foot, and then the echo organ would thunder right under our feet. We could feel the floorboards vibrating. We would sing until the veins stood out in our forehead and our sides of our necks. We were telling the world that our anchor was founded firm and deep. So here we are today in the middle of a pandemic, an economic crisis, a time of stress and upheaval. 
Do we have hope we talked about here today? Do we have an anchor that will hold firm in these storms of life? Of course we do. So turn up the volume on the speakers, open your windows, let the neighbors hear you sing. Michael, pull out the stops and let her rip because our anchor will hold. Michael, him 675. <laughs> Not sure I can follow that one. <laughs> <laughs> peace be with you. May grace restore you. May love, love through us. Before we go, I have sad news. Peggy Clark has passed away yesterday afternoon in Zurich, Ontario. Peggy was the organist and choir leader for St. Andrews United Church for many years and was truly involved in our community. She taught piano to many of the people in the village of Markham and I'm sure many who are on our service this morning. I don't have any more information at this time, but I know Peggy will be missed. 
Thank you for joining St. Andrews United Church's virtual worship service. The service is a result of a lot of volunteers who have donated their time and talents to make the virtual service a reality. And remember to mark on your calendars that the annual general meeting will be held at 9.15 on February the 28th and the votes taken on March 7th. And please join us next Sunday at 9.30 for a virtual coffee, tea, and chat. May you walk with the glory of God the whole week through. Louise, KC or Tampa Bay? <laughs> <laughs>